This is I Look Into My Glass by Thomas Hardy. And if this is your first visit to Thomas Hardy, then I'll tell you a bit about him. I do so on all the other poems that are in the Victorian era anthology for the Edexcel English literature piece. But each poem has a slightly different context or relevant context from Thomas Hardy's life. So in this case, Thomas Hardy, as you can see, was born 1840, and he goes uh, right through till 1928, where he died aged 87, didn't quite make 88, which means he spanned the Victorian values era right through to a modern era, through the First World War, through some very significant technological developments, and he has a kind of more secular, modernist approach to life. He was born the son of a stonemason, and he carried on that tradition in his own uh, career, not just as a writer, but as an architect. And he, with his brother, built his own house, which he lived in. He's most famous for writing novels. At, at the age of 16, he watched the hanging of Martha Brown, who was hung for the murder of her husband. And this is thought to have uh, influenced the model of the death of Tess in his novel, Tess of the D'Urbervilles. He wrote many other novels that were to become famous, Far From the Madding Crowd is one, Mayor of Casterbridge, Jude the Obscure. So he wrote novels until around about 1898, 1897, I think, when he wrote his last novel, The Well Beloved. I think uh, his novels were becoming less well received, so he gave up uh, writing novels because he didn't like criticism, and he started publishing poems. And his first collection was published in 1898, and this comes from uh, that first collection. So to the poem itself. And uh, if you know these little videos and these little annotations, you'll know that I'm a big fan of strategy when it comes to answering questions in the exam. There's poetry appreciation and there's getting a good mark in the exam. And I hope we come to understand both. So when you're faced with a poem in the exam and you've forgotten everything you were ever taught about it or you've never seen it before, which some exam boards do do where you have to look at the unseen poem, it's worth just going back to the strategy so as you can start that first sentence with something to say about the poem. So I'm pretty formal in this. I just go, right, let's start with rhyme scheme. It's a good place to start. It's a poem. It may or may not have one. Uh, but it's worth looking as part of the strategy. So in this case, we have got, um, uh, and we annotate in the way that you usually do, A, B, A, B, uh, new rhyme. So that becomes C, D, C, D. And since this is quite a short poem, we might as well do the rest of it as well. Don't always. E, F, E, F. If it were a longer poem, I'd stop around the first couple of stanzas, if not the first one. But this is pretty clear. This is an alternate rhyme scheme. So he's just writing a poem that rhymes very formally, and you call that a formal rhyme scheme. So the next thing is form, and that really does mean what is the form of the poem? What does it look like? Sometimes more modern poems can actually reflect what they're talking about. They can scatter the words across the page to indicate a shattered lifestyle or something like that. But in this case, it's fairly clear. And part of the strategy is to count the number of lines. So in this case, it's one, two, three, four. Pretty simple. That makes it quatrains. So the form of the poem is in quatrains. So the last part of the strategy is just to look at metre or beat, just to have an idea as to whether or not it's got any kind of beat that helps you read the poem or perhaps gets in the way of reading the poem if it's too strong a beat and it kind of uh, loses its meaning because you're sticking to the rhyme and the beat. So in this case, if we have a look at the number of syllables, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. It appears to be trimeter. Um, six syllables and three feet. Three feet means pairs of syllables. Okay, that's the standard way of annotating poetry. Okay, so then to the poem itself. And, and the first thing to look at perhaps is the title. Don't always look at the title, but the title sometimes is worth a look. It's usually 
the poet has thought about what they're going to call the poem. And in this case, it's I look into my glass. Glass is an archaic word for mirror. Yes, you would probably know that, but if you didn't, that's what he's doing. And it might be deliberate. It's not as if they didn't have the word mirror then, but he is calling it his glass. Then we come to the poem itself, and it's I look into my glass. So he's looking into the mirror, and it's first-person narrative stance. His, this is his personal view. I look into my glass. I am looking my, at myself. It's the poet's version of the artist's self-portrait. And it is in the present tense, which makes it quite immediate. And so then he carries on. I look into my glass and view my wasting skin. Wasting, in word, present participle, makes it more immediate, makes it more in your face, if you like. And we're looking at his face in the mirror or in the glass. So I look into my glass and view my wasting skin and say, and we get quote marks here, would God it came to pass my heart had shrunk as thin. I might re-emphasise that actually. Would God it came to pass my heart had shrunk as thin. Bit of enjambment there and it's exclamatory. There are other ways to read it. Would God it came to pass my heart had shrunk as thin. Which is less exclamatory. But he's put the exclamation mark on there. So he's, he's kind of taking God's name in vain. Which is perhaps another element of his personality that's relevant to context, this move from Victorian values to a modern way of thinking, a more secular way of thinking, which isn't so worried about saying, oh God, or oh my God, which many Victorians were, many very religious people were worried about taking God's name in vain, swearing by God. Unless you had a really good reason to swear by God, like swearing on the Bible, you should never do. But he does. And I think he is talking to himself rather than to God. And he's talking to his reflection. So what does it actually mean? Would God it came to pass my heart had shrunk as thin? So what he's looking at is his thin skin on his face, the way as you age, and he would have been about 60 here or coming up to 60. You can see that you're aging, but you still feel young. You still feel um, energetic. His heart, I think, in here does mean um, not the physical heart. So the heart here is a metaphor. It means the, the love that he holds inside himself or the desire to live, the energy that he has. So when he looks in the mirror, he doesn't see the man he's expecting to see. So in the next stanza, for then I undistressed by hearts grown cold to me. So then he's speculating as to what it would be like if he was 60, but still looked, shall we say, 30. Okay, for then I, undistressed by hearts grown cold to me, has the meaning that if his heart had grown cold, if his heart had shrunk as thin, if he wasn't desiring as much, he would be undistressed, he would not be bothered by the fact that other people don't like him as much, that others are rejecting him. And he could lonely, got the post modifier there, post modifying the modal verb, wait for my endless rest, pre modifier there, and a euphemism for death. And he could wait for death with equanimity. So if my heart had grown cold, like my skin had grown thin, then I'd be okay about, you know, nobody liking me because I was old and grey and I would be happy to wait for my death with equanimity, which is a collocation, a pair of words we're used to hearing next to each other, and it means acceptance. But time, he goes on to say in the third stanza, and he capitalises time to give it personification, but time to make me grieve, part steals, let's part abide. So it takes some of his youth, but not all of this, all of his youth. But time to make me grieve, after the per personification of time, it sort of takes on a more angry feel. And then part steals part let's abide. Steals is a strong 
verb to use. It has an angry and accusative atmosphere to it. So it's quite accusative, quite strong in its conversation with whoever it is or whatever it is that has created this fragile frame. And shakes this fragile frame, which is alliteration, at eve with throbbings of noontide. So his fragile frame is this 60-year-old man. And let's not forget, he had a while to go yet. He went until he was 87. He went until 1928. Um, so he wasn't as fragile as he thought he was. Um, and shakes this fragile fa frame at eve with throbbings and throbbings. There's no real other interpretation to throbbings other than uh, lust. He is talking not just about heart, not just about love, but he is talking about lust and about uh, sex. And it's worth mentioning here that his second wife, Florence Dugdale, was 39 years younger than him. And during his marriage to Emma Gifford, she died in 1912, so she's alive when this poem was written, he was interested in other younger win women. Uh, and uh, whether or not he ever acted on that is hard to know. But uh, the poem At an Inn reflects on the illicit meeting between a man and probably a younger woman who should not be meeting because one or both of them is married. And most likely that's reflecting on some of the relationships he had uh, while his wife was still alive. So think what you may about Thomas Hardy. He was obviously an active and potent man and slightly frustrated that as he grew older, he was less interesting to those who wa he wanted to be interested in him. So, yes, finally, there's that um, Eve, fragile frame at Eve, which is old age and noontide, which is a young, nice little metaphor there to add to the idea of uh, this conflict between feeling youthful, but not actually being youthful. And the fact that Thomas Hardy spanned the Victorian era into the modern era makes perhaps his his reflections on sex, on youth, on life. And of course, in, in the other poems about the Boer War or about war, perhaps more modern than the early Victorians in earlier in uh, such as Christina Rossetti or um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning or even Robert Browning, any of them have a more traditional approach to, well, a more traditional and Victorian approach to moral values and to life, uh, in his thinking.